Hey everyone, welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best. Although, this time around, uh, these ones aren't quite as adorable as some of the other episodes. Uh, to jump to the chase, these are cop pewters. This is what goes in... Well, I was going to say the trunk of a cop car, although I've since learned that uh, that's not really the intent. Um, these are actually supposed to go uh, between the front seats. Uh, there's a little pedestal uh, that holds a monitor above them, but I didn't learn this until like two weeks after I shot the video, which is why I'm back here reshooting the intro. So throughout this video, I'm going to be saying, you know, in the trunk over and over, and it's not actually true. Uh, but a lot of the same considerations apply. If you're putting a computer in a car, it needs to be vibration resistant. It needs to be able to handle very high temperatures because, you know, if it's sitting in a park lot for three days during like the California summer uh, it's gonna get roasting in there with no air conditioning going and uh, that alone could be enough to damage components in a normal PC so you've got to ruggedize the crap out of them and then they've got to be dust sealed right because as the vehicle vibrates around you're gonna have dirt lifting off the carpet and if it gets you know picked up by a fan and uh, ends up inside the machine it could uh, choke out the CPU that sort of thing uh, and of course you know cop cars get hit, stuff like that. So it's gotta be able to take some pretty hard jolts. So these are built very solidly as you'll be seeing, uh, which is why I'm interested in them. I don't particularly love looking at cop or military equipment, just um, kind of makes me feel not great. Uh, and the same is true for Motorola, who, for reasons I don't want to get into, are not a fantastic company. I have some inside information from people who worked there about a number of military things they were involved with that, again, don't make me feel great at all. So none of this particularly matters because I did not give them any money for these things. They are quite old, uh, as the <laughs> Windows sticker suggests. Uh, they're just something that came out of the trash that a viewer sent me, so whatever. Um, as an opportunity to take a look at how one ruggedizes a computer... I'm going to go for it. Uh, but in the future, I'm hoping that somebody will send me stuff from, you know, ambulances, fire trucks, uh, that sort of stuff uh, that's not uh, quite as grody to think about in terms of its day-to-day -day life. So unsurprisingly, these things have some years on them. You can tell from the uh, Windows Vista sticker on the front. But there's actually something interesting about that. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking that maybe this didn't come with it. Maybe this was put on here as a joke because this is for Windows Vista Basic. And when I looked at that at first, I was like, Vista Basic, what the hell is that? Uh, so I was thinking to myself, huh, could this be one of those uh, versions of Windows that's for, you know, developing nations that's like really low spec and whatnot? Well, no, it's actually a perfectly normal one. I just completely forgot it existed. See, back in the Vista era, Microsoft made an absolute hash of their SKUs. Uh, that is to say, Windows Vista came out in about a thousand different editions and nobody could keep track of which one was which. It was super confusing. Uh, everybody made fun of it. It was a meme for a long time. And then they theoretically simplified it with Windows 7, but not really as it turns out. So basic is the sticker that you'd see on a machine that came with Windows Vista Home Basic, which I had forgotten existed. See, I used to sell used computers, right? So I handled a lot of machines from the mid to late 2000s that came with Windows Vista. And every single one that was not a business machine came with Vista Home Premium. I don't think I ever saw one with Home Basic. Uh, apparently it existed, but it seems like nobody got it. My guess is that the OEMs looked at it and went, well, there's like a $3 difference for the license, so let's just go with Premium. So we'll come back to why that sticker is still odd in a minute. But while I was here, I happened to read the section on Vista Starter, and it reminded me that in several past videos, uh, particularly in the Quick Start series, I have made a silly mistake. I've mixed up Vista Starter and 7 Starter because this is, again, one of Microsoft's incredibly stupid stupid uh, branding decisions. So Vista Starter was in fact a version of Windows that was intended for use in developing countries. Uh, so it was like super low end, it was missing a bunch of features, it didn't have Arrow and whatnot, and it got deployed on a whole bunch of like super low end PCs uh, that were like sold for very little or given away by charity or whatever. But here's the thing, if we go over and look at Windows 7, it also had a starter, except this one was intended for use on like netbooks and tablets and other low-end machines sold in, you know, the US and whatnot. Well, it also had a Home Basic, which I did not know. I've never heard of Windows 7 Home Basic. Well, it turns out that that's the one for emerging markets. So yeah, uh, Microsoft, in addition to having this already incredibly confusing list of SKUs, right? They got Starter, Home Basic, Home Premium, and then for Vista, they also had Business and Ultimate. Well, for seven, they trimmed it down to just starter, home, and professional, except that behind the scenes, they also had enterprise, and they still had ultimate, 
And then they had a home basic, but they swapped the definition with starter between Vista and seven. Like what, why? This is really confusing and completely unnecessary. Like if they're gonna change the names entirely, I would understand, but why the hell did they switch them? Ugh. Being mad at Microsoft is so original. Why don't I do some of that? So anyway, the thing that makes the uh, home basic sticker so odd is of course, that these would never have come with a home version of Windows, right? It would have either been XP embedded, because Microsoft never made an embedded version of Vista, as far as I know, or it would have been Vista Pro. Uh, and in this case, we can actually tell that this one came with, sure enough, Vista Business, as you'd expect. But this one is also from 2009, seems to be from the 27th week of, whereas this one, it's got a frame on the bottom, so I can't show you, but the sticker on there says it's from 2010, uh, and it's also got a, a newer processor as well, and it has a Windows 7 Pro COA on it, as you'd expect. So yeah, I'm guessing somebody put that sticker on there just as a joke. Despite those differences though, uh, these are actually the same model, F5208A. And just to be clear, that's only the model of the PC itself. There's a monitor and keyboard and other parts to go with this. And once you put it all together, it becomes an MW810. And I do have those parts and I'll put it all together later. But just if you're curious, this is the part number you'd look up if you wanted to buy one of these by itself on eBay. Not that you should, because without the rest of the parts, they're useless. And even if you have them, they're not terribly interesting. Most of what makes this interesting is on the inside, as usual, and I will be taking it apart, but first, let's uh, finish the tour of the outside. On the front, all we have is this flap, which exposes what I thought was an express card slot. I mean, we're talking about 2009, 2010 here, but it turns out that's actually card bus. I have no idea why. My guess is that it's something to do either with um, being able to put like a CF card in there, which you could do through express card, but it's not gonna be as, um, uh, native to the BIOS if you're trying to boot from it, or some sort of specialty hardware that was only produced in a card bus variant. I, I don't know, that, that seems really odd. Although there were bridge machines in this era that had both card bus and express cards. So there must have been like legacy hardware stuff that didn't get updated to the new express card format. Then above that, we've got a SIM card slot, which has what appears to actually be an ejection button next to it, which I've never actually seen before. Usually uh, you just have to sort of pick it out with your fingernails. So that, that was interesting, uh, but that's it. That's the only external detail on the whole thing other than the power button. And again, since this is in the trunk, you'll never need to actually press that. It gets turned on remotely. This down here is the hard drive caddy. I will uh, take one of those apart later. They are quite interesting. And then we have the ports and boy, howdy, do we have ports. Unsurprisingly, everything is weather sealed. I mean, this thing's not supposed to be out in the elements as it were, but we at least want dust covers because it's gonna be in a trunk that's rattling around all the time. It's gonna slowly, you know, lift dust off the carpet and it's gonna drift into the ports and whatnot. So these are all really irritating. <laughs> Once you pull these off, they're just sort of in, in the way. I kind of hate them. Uh, so I'm not gonna pull them all open, but most of these things are pretty straightforward. We've got RJ45 ethernet here, here, and here. We've got standard uh, DE9 serial here and here. Uh, so these are the interesting things. You can see this connector is, you know, nothing. That's not VGA or DVI or anything. I thought it was an LVDS interface because I've seen some industrial machines that had an external LVDS plug that looked just like this, but I don't think that's what it is. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Then over here, we've got, eh, come on, this aux connector. That's another strange, you know, mini Centronics plug. And I don't know what that is, but I suspect it's some serial ports. And I did see a picture on eBay of a thing that plugs in here, but it didn't really shed a whole lot of light. It's got four weird round connectors on it, but I suspect those are just RS-232 in a different shape. Next up, we've got three USB ports here, and those are unsurprisingly USB 2.0. Uh, 3.0 was out at this point, but I'm not surprised that they didn't spend the extra money for the controllers and the more complex connectors, uh, given that there wouldn't be much application for it uh, in this use case. Uh, what is interesting about these though, if you take a look at these lugs here and there, those are actually for uh, USB plugs that screw in. And now that you know those exist, you're probably pretty angry that they aren't on everything, as you should be. There you go. I have not tested this for fit, but it looks like it'll go in there. Let's see. Uh, oh, <laughs> looking right at it. I still got it upside down. There we go. So yeah, if you're going to have this thing bouncing around in the trunk of a car, uh, USB is going to work its way out over time, but that won't. Every single USB port should have these and everyone knows it. Finally, along the bottom here, we've got all of our RF. Uh, this thing unsurprisingly has built-in GPS. Uh, we've got our video input for the dash cam recorder. And then it doesn't have the 
Wi-Fi connectors. Those would have just been normal SMA. And then these plugs here are interesting. They go to the uh, 3G cellular modem, and I initially identified them as TNC, a threaded version of BNC that was often used on wireless routers, but they're actually mini UHF, which I have not seen in decades. Weird little connectors, but you can identify them because of the, uh, the little crenellated teeth there. Finally, rounding things out, we've got the power. Now, this thing obviously runs off of a uh, vehicle power system, so, you know, 12 to 14 volts, and it uses one of these, which is, I don't know if there's a name for it. It's sort of a, a de facto plug for automotive power, as far as I know, and they're, they're just terrible. I'll show you this shortly, but I really don't like these, and I never have. They are at least quite high current, I think. I, I feel like you could put a good, you know, dozen amps over that, at least but they just don't mate very positively, if you ask me. Uh, finally, above that, we've got the power switch, which you'll notice ain't going nowhere because you've got to pull out on it before it'll uh, change position. These are wonderful, and you can get these from, like, DigiKey or Mauser still. Uh, you should really, if you're building something where power is important, get a latching power switch. They're nice. So you can probably guess that other than the uh, strange plugs, it is pretty much a normal PC. Uh, but of course, those strange plugs make it not very interesting if you're thinking about buying one on eBay. There is no VGA, no HDMI. You're going to struggle to get any sort of display hooked up to this thing. Uh, but fortunately, I do have the display. The person who sent me this also included the uh, head unit for it. And naturally, it is completely proprietary. You know, when you look at military gear and it's got those funky round plugs on them with the thousand pins and you're like, well, I'm never going to find a cable for that. If you found one of these and you didn't have the thing it went with, you would throw this away. You can't put it on eBay. You can't Google what it goes with. You know, that model number isn't going to turn up anything. So, uh, yeah, it's just a mystery plug, unless you know exactly what it's for. As I said earlier, I don't have any other ruggedized PCs. I'd like to. I'd really like to have the ones, you know, that show up in ambulances and, and fire trucks and uh, many other applications. Uh, but the problem is, usually, when you look them up on eBay or whatever, you'll find the machines, but you won't find these parts, the special cables, the special displays. In fact, the other day, somebody put me onto this line of computers that's used in buses that they work with in their uh, day job, and you can get them on eBay for like, I think 30 or $40, but again, you don't have the million pin plug for most of the stuff that they're supposed to plug into, so it's kind of boring. So this is the head unit and it's an LCD display with, of course, a touchscreen, uh, built-in soft keys, and it's also a USB hub, but it all hooks up to the machine with a single plug, so that's why this thing has a million pins in it instead of just being like normal HDMI or DVI or something. Uh, and then we have a USB port here that's for the keyboard, which is one of the worst keyboards I've ever seen, or rather felt, because it, it just, mm, it's incredibly mushy. It does not feel good under the hand. And my guess is that that's because it's it's been probably liquid sealed, so it probably has like a, a super thick membrane in there. But either way, I just I would not like to type on this for any protracted period if I could avoid it. Uh, the touchpad is also just terrible, but that was just sort of par for the course for touchpads in this era. It is backlit, as I'll show you later, so that's a plus, I guess. Also, it has the uh, screw-in USB plug. That's where I got that earlier. So at least it's not going to rattle out while you're driving around. All right, so there's the system all assembled, uh, and I don't really have anywhere to put this LCD because it doesn't have a standard Visa pattern on it. So I'm just gonna have to sort of lean it up somewhere. The power supply that came with this thing is definitely not quote unquote original, uh, at least I'm, I'm hoping it isn't. Uh, obviously, since this thing's meant to be used in a car, you're usually supposed to run it off the car. Uh, so somebody had to fabricate this power supply to use at the bench. And this is just like some yeah, what is this? An Aztec 14-volt, uh, 10-amp uh, power supply, which sounds impressive, but honestly, it doesn't weigh nearly as much as I would expect for its size. Like, I'm not really sure why it's so big. And this cable that's on here, I think was just... I think they just got this from something else because it's got two wires on here that aren't hooked up to anything. They're just sort of hanging out over here and the cable's not actually inside the strain relief either. So, yeah, I think this was all hacked together. But it does the job. So these are those plugs I was talking about, these uh, sort of automotive plugs that I do not like. Uh, on the monitor side, it's not too bad. It sort of seats in there okay, but it's really unpleasant to plug in. Like, eh, sort of got to wiggle it back and forth. And it's not very positive. There's no click. You're not really sure 
when it's all the way in. And it's even worse on the uh, computer itself because if we plug this in here and then you take a look, can you see that? There's actually metal. There's metal hanging out right there. So these things aren't even fully insulated and I've never really seen them do any better. So yeah, I don't like this plug. Just, um, just use Anderson power pole. Why didn't they do that? It's a better plug. All right, we're juiced up. And if we turn on the monitor here, it automatically turns on the PC. There we go. And of course, this is just a, a normal PC, unsurprisingly. So we've got uh, ordinary BIOS. This BIOS is so basic, I don't think it even tells you what hardware is in there. Like, normally it will tell you what CPU there is, but here it's just like, uh, you got two gigs. Pretty much everything has been cut out of here. Like, there's no advanced anything. It's just boot information, security info, that's it. Now, this one has been reloaded by somebody. It would have come with Vista, like I said, but it's got XP on it. That's fine for our purposes, and frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these got XP on them in the field anyway. All right, there we go. I forgot to mention that's another thing that's going through that big, thick uh, monitor umbilical. It's also got audio. And the speaker on here sounds surprisingly good. I'm not sure if it came across on the mic, but it's got like a decent amount of bass, despite being, you know, <laughs> three quarters of an inch across. What is that in metric? Like uh, 20 millimeters, something like that. All right, so here we are in Windows XP, and this does not have any of the original software on it, uh, except for Motorola VRCH. Um, this is, I think it's Virtual Radio Control. Oh, it literally says Virtual Radio Control Head right there. I'm a very smart man. And this does exactly what it says on the tin. Basically, um, you'd put this thing in the trunk of a cop car next to like a multi-frequency radio that has no interface of its own. And then you'd plug it into this thing via serial, which is why if we hit this, it says it can't reach the thing over serial. Uh, and that's also uh, partly what these function keys are for. Basically, this would be running this software at all times. Uh, this is the primary interface to the radio in the car. And then these buttons get tied to various functions in it. In fact, I think it's... Uh, yeah, there's eight buttons here and eight buttons there, so probably it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, but in reality, these are just function keys. If we go into the control panel, we've got a extra key configuration program, and you can bind these to whatever you want. Uh, you can either have them trigger a particular key, or they can run a program, or they can do a couple of special actions. So you can set one up to uh, hibernate or, or suspend the machine, or put in a tab which probably is because people would have been doing a lot of uh, data entry on these and being able to just hit a button here to, to tab forward was probably of value. But that's the only specialized software on here, so otherwise we'll just take a peek at the hardware. Not a lot going on there, of course. You know, built-in mobile Intel 4 Series Express, so, you know, no acceleration. Uh, the Ethernet. I wanted to talk about the Ethernet. I, I pointed out there were three separate RJ45s on the back, but only one of them is gigabit. It's this Marvel Yukon one here. The other two are 100 megabit. And of course, this thing's not gonna spend much of its life on networks, right? Because it's it's gonna go in the trunk of a car. So my guess is that the gig ethernet is mostly just there in case you're like net booting this thing, like reloading it back at the, at the shop. Uh, but then the other two ports, those are there so you can plug it into other ethernet based devices that it might be working with in the field. And you're definitely not gonna need uh, gigabit ethernet for that. You're not even gonna need 100 meg. Moving on, we've got four serial ports here. Now I'm guessing the first two are the normal nine pin serial ports we saw on the back. The next two here, if they're even exposed anywhere, are probably going through that aux port that we saw. Uh, this one here, COM21, the reason I have that turned off is because I was experimenting with it and I thought maybe that would be the touch screen because a lot of older touch panels and, and maybe current ones, I don't know, um, are actually serial behind the scenes and they just have a USB to serial adapter built in, but I turned it off and the touch screen still works. So I'm not sure what that was being used for. And then finally, we have COM22, which is the Sierra Wireless Gobi 2000, apparently a terrible 3G cellular modem. And also, apparently, the name and device manager indicates that it hasn't received a firmware image, because apparently these things always start up brain dead and have to be spoon-fed their smarts by the driver, uh, which I'm fine with, because if there are any 3G networks left, I don't want to be on them. For a processor, we've got a Core 2 Duo P8400. I could not remember what the P stood for, so I looked it up, and uh, somebody on Ars Technica forums said that it's the same as the T-Series, except that it uses less power. I don't know if that's strictly true, but apparently this is a 25-watt TDP instead of a 35-watt. This is a mobile CPU, by the way, as I'll show you later, which kind of surprised me, but uh, it's probably good enough for, you know, running a radio. 
So the only other interesting device on here is the Kinexant, is that how you pronounce that? Uh, video capture card for the, uh, the dash cam input, which intriguingly appears to have been customized for this device because it's got MW810, the Motorola part number, there in the device name. Really the only hardware feature about this that's the least bit interesting is the uh, video capture card. So let's get a video source. And I put a copy of Virtual Dub on here. We'll fire that up. All right, and when we switch our camera on, there's the picture. And I'll record some footage here in a second, but I wanted to show you something interesting about this. Standard definition video capture cards were very jelly bean type devices. So it's not surprising that this thing shows up as a normal like video for Windows direct show device. But what is interesting is that if we go into the video source option, the only choice is composite video. Now, these chips pretty much universally supported S-Video and component capture. And even if they didn't physically have those ports installed on a card, the options would usually be there. They just wouldn't do anything. You just get nothing. In this case, they've actually bothered to adjust the driver or the firmware so that it hides the inputs you can't use, which might be part of why it's for MW810, because since this thing is supposed to be a dash cam recorder, you wouldn't want it to just randomly one day power up and accidentally switch into S-Video input, right? So if you block off all the other options, then you can't find out later that, whoops, it was rolling for 16 hours on just a black screen. Another interesting thing is if we go in to select a codec, there actually weren't any originally. I had to install XVID because every other codec on here, like Cinepak and H.263 and whatnot, uh, apparently is not compatible with whatever this card's capturing. It seems to just be YUY2, and I, I seemed to remember back in the day that several of these codecs would work with that, but I guess not, and they all suck anyway, so yeah, let's go XVID. So like I said, when I first tested this, there were no codecs installed. So I tried recording a clip with just uncompressed YUY2, and it was recording at like 20 megabytes per second, which was uh, pretty spicy. But to my shock, the hard drive kept up. This just has like a, a Western digital spinner in it, uh, but it's 7200 RPM, and it, it did the job. So hooray. Uh, but this, I'm guessing, is going to look about as good at, uh, what is this, 1.2 megabits per second. We'll see. If it's crappier, then I'll, I'll put a comparison up so you can see what the difference is. Uh, it is interlaced, and that does not look very good. And I could not get anything to deinterlace it the last time I tried, so this is probably still going to going to have some some streaking going on. Uh, not that I particularly care. There's probably a way to, to fix that in virtual dub, but I'm never going to use this thing again, so whatever. What's interesting to me, though, is the quality of the captured image. Like, for composite, this looks pretty damn good, right? I've, I've captured a lot of composite into a lot of capture cards, and this is one of the better looking pictures I've ever seen. Now, this is a pretty nice camera. It's a Sony DSR250, which is not a high-end pro unit, but it's better than pretty much any consumer camera you could buy uh, in the standard def era. So it's it's making the best possible composite image, but I'm still pretty impressed by the, the quality of the picture. Now, this is using that Connexant chip, which generally speaking, I didn't see too often on capture cards. Usually you'd see like a Brooktree 848 or 878, and those were all right, but they were just a bit blurrier than this in my experience. Or maybe they've just done something to, you know, protect the signal path that those those capture cards didn't, I don't know. Or maybe I'm just misremembering, you know, I'm just talking, I'm just saying words, but it looks pretty damn good to me. And uh, it makes sense given the application, right? They, they would want to get the highest quality dash cam footage for all the reasons that we already know. Now I was seeing some frame drops while I was recording that. Let's see if those showed up in the recorded video. Well, at least here it looks pretty good. But anyway, that's the only interesting capability this thing has. Um, I don't know what other software it would have run. So let's just go ahead and tear it apart. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention about this screen. This is apparently a panic button. You hit that and it sends like a uh, SOS back to headquarters. So taking these things apart is kind of a pain in the ass because they are so ruggedized. Everything is stuck together with Loctite and whatnot. So I'm going to leave this one uh, intact because I baked this one before the show. As far as I know, they're exactly the same hardware inside, so you're not missing anything. So first things first, we're going to pull out the hard drive caddy, and that actually ends up being pretty interesting in and of itself, like possibly the most interesting thing. So these were the days of miracle and wonder, <laughs> the long distance call. SSDs existed in 2009 and 2010, but they hadn't really become standard equipment for, for some reason. I'm not sure exactly why that was, 
but as far as I recall, I don't remember seeing an SSD in most machines or even most business machines for a few years after that. I don't know. I might have my years off, but uh, the point is this thing has just an ordinary spinning hard drive in it. And this is not an uncommon thing in, you know, early ruggedized machines. But of course, it, it is a problem because spinning hard drives are very sensitive to vibration. So obviously, you can expect that they're going to be cushioned very severely. But this one is cushioned a bit more intensely than I expected. Yeah. Look at these um, spaceship parts. Obviously, we've got some... Uh, elastomers in here, right? You know, when you're trying to, to keep a hard drive from uh, head crashing as you're driving around at 80 miles an hour over potholes, uh, you're obviously gonna have to put it on a whole bunch of rubber and that's what they've done. Now, this isn't even the most rubber I've seen. If you open up like the uh, the drive caddy for a Panasonic Toughbook from like 2004, you'll find the hard drive is simply floating in a sea of gelatin basically it's like um it's like ballistic gelatin <laughs> this is very wobbly silicone stuff but this this is sort of its own thing and of course everything's screwed down this is a a theme that you're going to see several times like obviously yes computers are usually screwed together but this one has more screws than most i mean seriously most uh, like laptop hard drive caddies that i've seen this connector is just sort of floating like it's press fit into a spot uh, or it's held on by the lid or whatever but here they bothered to bolt it down now given the size of this thing i'd assumed that it would have a three and a half inch hard drive in it but for a number of reasons that's obviously not possible i mean the uh the connector wouldn't line up for one thing and also like there wouldn't be any room for any of the elastomer the rubber in fact the lid won't even go on with a, a three and a half inch drive so this is unsurprisingly a two and a half and I said it was a Western Digital, but it's actually a Seagate. You know, I also said that it was a 7200 RPM drive, and it isn't. It's a 5400. Huh. This caddy, this thing is quite a piece of work. I've never seen anything quite like it. I mean, obviously, we've got all the rubber going on, right? We've got rubber bumpers on the corners, and then we've got uh, rubber supports here. But, yeah, there's just layers upon layers of it. Like, so we've got this metal bushing in the middle, which the bolt goes through right? So the drive is moving around that bolt like this, and that gives you a lot of your protection. But we've got the uh, sort of um, the sort of silicone condom up here that holds the central bushing, but then there's another thick like foam rubber bushing inside that. That's not like hard rubber. That's like neoprene in there. So that I guess if this does manage to jostle that hard and reach the end of its travel, then it'll start compressing that neoprene. So they've buffered the hell out of it, and that makes sense. But what I'm not sure about is why it weighs so much. Like, these here are obviously just weights. Like, they've built this frame much, much more heavily than they needed to. This could have just been a flat piece of sheet metal. So I, I don't know much about this stuff, but my thinking is that more mass dampens the vibration. So they've actually made this heavy on purpose so that it'll be harder for it to shake around. I don't know if that's how that works, but it sure looks like it. So it looks super weird, but it does make sense. What makes less sense is the hard drive situation itself. This looks like a mess, and I think if we take a close look at it, it seems apparent that it wasn't really designed to work like this. This is kind of a hack. Let's get the drive out of here. The first thing you notice, actually, is that these screws are kind of undersized for the... Um, the holes are going into. These look like they accommodated much larger screws at some point. They also have screw holes here, and I don't know what that pattern would be for, but clearly they had several different applications for this caddy. So for a lot of drive caddies, they'll just have the serial ATA connector hanging out the back, but other times they'll have it adapted into some funky plug like this, and it's usually for no good reason that I'm aware of, other than they just don't trust SATA. They stopped doing this after the, the first few years of the standard, as far as I can tell. But in this case, the reason they're using this funky plug is because there's other stuff going on in here. This, this right here, this baffled me when I first looked at it. This is completely independent from the drive. Like, the, the SATA connector is over here, so this is going to be um, the power or the ground rail for it. Uh, these are some of the data lines, right? There's, there's probably more on the other side of this... Um, flexible PCB, but then these are completely independent, and there's a, what looks like a tran... No, sorry, that's a six-pin component there, so I'm not sure what that is, but it's some kind of IC, and we've got a capacitor, and we've got a resistor, so there's there's active electronics on here, but then there's, there's this thing, and when I first looked at that, I was like, 
is that an antenna or some sort of like inductive pickup? Because I see a coil in there. It kind of looks like an antenna and it's right over the, the head spindle, the, the spot where the, the head pivots back and forth. So I'm like, are they, are they using this to sense head motion? And then I thought to myself, that's stupid. Are they using this as a, a, like a thermistor, right? As a, a temperature sensor. Maybe they don't trust the drive's onboard temperature sensor, so they're, they're doing their own to be more precise. But that doesn't make any sense really either. And also, uh, although this is described as R2 on the PCB, so this is a resistor, I tried ohming it out and I got 10 ohms and I put my thumb on there and it didn't respond to temperature or pressure changes. Um, I tried hitting it with some canned duster, like upside down to freeze it. And it only sunk by like 0.4 ohms. So I'm sitting here absolutely baffled as to what the hell this could be. And then it clicks with me. The person who sent this to me told me that it has a hard drive heater. And that sounds like a very silly idea, but remember this is going to be sitting in the trunk of a car, possibly in like Wisconsin. It's going to get down to like super freezing temperatures. So you don't want the grease on the head spindle to freeze. I think, yeah, there's a second heater under there as well. So that's heating the, uh, the platter spindle. And then this is heating the pivot for the head. And I read in the manual that when this gets down to below 41 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, I believe, then it turns these on. And at 10 ohms, if these are being fed 12 volts, then that's about 14 watts, uh, which is quite a bit of heating for, for something this small. So they could be using five volts or they could be using um, PWM. But anyway, you slice it, that's what these are. And it's kind of interesting because they stuck this foam rubber like furniture pad in here and I don't think it's really supposed to be here like it, it seems to perfectly fit the size of this heating element but it's sort of digging in to this part of the ribbon here and then this part is just sort of riding up on it so I'm kind of wondering if they put this here because they found that the um that this ribbon was pressing against the heating element and getting damaged by it or something like that and also there's kind of a, a hackish energy to it like Okay, so this part here is sort of stuck down. It's like um, adhesived to the back of the drive, but this heating element is just kind of floating and there's nothing that really holds it in place. So maybe that's what the furniture pad is for. It's so it gets compressed a little bit by something to press it against the drive, but that doesn't make sense because it would have to be pressed against the top or bottom of the caddy and it would transfer a whole bunch of vibrations. So yeah, nothing could be compressing that. So I think it's just to space out the mylar here it seems like with their funding, Motorola could have done a better job of designing this. This feels like they built it and then they found problems with it and then they just sort of half-assed a solution. Not to mention that this flexible PCB was clearly not designed for this caddy. Uh, this was designed for one where the connector comes out in line with the drive and then they decided to reuse it and just fold it over and put a crease in it. And then they had to put this piece of foam rubber here to, I guess, protect it from the, um, the sharp edges on the caddy. Not that they're all that sharp, so I'm not sure what that's even needed for. And it also covers up one of these holes. And on top of all that, they had to put this piece of Kapton tape across here to insulate the back of the, um, well, I guess some of these pads here. I mean, again, I'm not really sure why that needs to be there. There's nothing in here that should be able to touch against that. Yeah, this is a mess. Look at this thing. This, this, is, not, this is not up to the standard of quality of the rest of the device, as you'll see as we go through it. This thing is all bespoke parts, and then this is a weird, hacky, reused pile of parts from something else. It seems very out of place, very odd. But anyway, let's put this back together and take a look at the rest. By the way, this thing actually has uh, soft mounts for the connector on the back of the sled. It doesn't seem like it would need that, like the connector is, is not going to be able to rattle out of place. It's pinched in there by the, uh, the sled and the chassis, but they put them on there anyway. And then there's more soft mounts on the, the pins that go into the chassis. So yeah, they really, really wanted to control vibration, which makes sense. But even so, man, some of this feels like overkill. Now there is one more detail on the outside though I wanted to show you because it's not that remarkable, but it's, it's just sort of weird looking in this context. So this is the fan tray. Uh, unsurprisingly, this thing uh, has replaceable fans. Although, I mean, 
I guess it is a bit of a surprise because most of the machines I look at on this show are entirely passively cooled. And this one sort of looks like it from the get go, right? Like you see, there's no obvious vents anywhere and they do have the radiator fins here, but they don't really have them where you'd expect. You'd figure the whole thing would be covered in them, right? But I guess because this is meant to go in the trunk of a car, they figured the convection wasn't that reliable. So they did put forced air cooling on it, but it only acts on this one little section of cast in radiator over here. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it makes sense. The forced air is going to be better than just plain convection, but it doesn't seem like enough. It, it feels like if you were going to bother with it, that you'd want to have more than this. The other odd thing, is that these are, are shock mounted. No, they're not, I'm sorry. They just sit on solid pegs down there, but then these are little rubber plugs. Oh, I guess it's because they just didn't want to put screws in them. So instead they just sit on those locating pegs and then these just get you know, compressed by the lid and hold them in place. I guess they didn't want to tap threads for these and screw them in place. Like, really? It seems kind of lazy. Huh, otherwise though, they're uh, just some fans. And there it is. It's got that um, sort of a lot of money was spent on this design energy that a lot of devices on this show don't. Um, I'm guessing this cost a lot more to design and manufacture and sold for a hell of a lot more than the machines that go into digital signage or you know controlling CNC machines or whatever the hell else. So it's not surprising, but man, it almost has a kind of like RF equipment uh, energy to it. Now that I think about it, I was making a joke about that, but hey, <laughs> this is the uh, 3G uh, EVDO modem here. This is a GPS modem. It makes sense that they would be isolated from one another now that I think about it and, and from the rest of the machine by the big like die cast magnesium plate below them. So yeah, yeah, um, I'm very smart. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not magnesium. That is AL. That's aluminum. I had assumed this was magnesium both because that's just usually what I see in this sort of thing. And also from the surface finish, I, I usually expect that from magnesium things, but yeah, there you go. Is this top panel also aluminum? I don't see any sort of mark on there to say what sort of material it is, but from the sheen and the fact that it's part of this thing, I guess I'm gonna assume that's also aluminum. So where to begin? Well, um, I mentioned the uh, the 3G uh, wireless radio here, so that's for your, your cellular connectivity. But then this thing here, this is the GPS, and that was, was kind of unusual. I hadn't seen anything like that because the antenna for it is this guy right here, and it just goes in there, and there's no way to unplug it. Like, normally, you've got the plug sitting on top of a card, but here, it's just trapped under there. So I unscrewed this little cage and took it off, but nothing got better, and I didn't see any obvious way to remove this, but it turns out that you just pull it out, and it's got this uh, little tiny eight pin mezzanine plug here. I don't know if this is a standard form factor or something they had made custom. Maybe this is normal for GPS devices, but it turns out that the antenna plug is just hanging out here on the bottom, and it had a sticker over it initially, and so my brain just sort of tuned it out, so I was just like, oh, I guess the GPS antenna is just permanently installed. I'm yeah, very smart. So nothing is left to chance, and thus the uh, GPS antenna is normally uh, seated into these little cable guides here. Same goes with every other cable in here. Before we can take this board out, though, we have to remove this one, so let's take a look at that. This board has a number of the more interesting things on it. So these are our 200 megabit ethernet chips, which is why we've got two plugs here, and then the other one is down here, because the controllers are on separate boards. Thought that was interesting. This guy here is the uh, Connexant uh, video capture chip, although it's described as a PCIe AV decoder. And that's also how it's described in every listing I can find online, data sheets, etc. Now I've never seen a capture card called a decoder before. I, I suppose I can, I can see why they would call it that, but man, what a weird term. And I did confirm that this chip supports S-Video and components. So they just turned those off in the firmware, I guess. But now this thing, who boy, this, this withstands some discussion. This is another Connexant chip, but it's an SDVO TV VGA DVI. And that is a, what is that part number? CX25904. And if you look that up, you won't get a whole lot of information, but I figured out what it is. Looking up the part number won't get you anything, but looking up SDVO will. 
So some people know, and some people weren't in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. These things were all over in like enterprise, um, like business machines in the mid to late 2000s. And if you were working in like eCycle or enterprise IT or something, you'd find these things and you'd try to plug them into like a normal PC and nothing would happen. They look like graphics cards. They've got a PCIe X16 slot, although it only has 4X worth of pins, and they have a DVI port, which amusingly has a logo for DVI, which I didn't even know existed before I saw one of these things. Uh, but if you plug it into like your Asus motherboard, you won't get a picture out of it. You eventually get sick of seeing these things and just start throwing them in the trash. That's what I did. That's what everybody else I knew did. Uh, and nobody knew what the hell they were. I mean, that thing is way too small to be any kind of GPU. Even the worst like S3 Trio 3D graphics card, the, the chip on it was at least that big. So it turns out, no, these are not graphics cards. These are SDVO cards. And the idea, from what I understand, is that in like the early 2000s, Intel was having trouble with the fact that their integrated graphics chips supported multi-head and multi-format outputs, but a lot of vendors didn't want to put multiple connectors on the board just in case somebody wanted to use another output. So Intel came up with this approach where if you plug a card like this into a PCIe slot, the chipset will detect that it's an SDVO card and it'll switch into a special SDVO mode where this card basically gets um, bridged straight over to the chipset's uh, video output in a special format called SDVO, Serial Digital Video Out. And all this does is take that generic format and then convert it into either DVI or VGA or conceivably they could have done HDMI if it had stuck around long enough, though as far as I can tell it didn't. And that's it. It's just a way to get another head onto your integrated graphics. Now, this raises some interesting questions. I could not get a data sheet for the chip that's in here, so I don't know if that outputs DVI or what. Uh, and of course, since this interface here is completely proprietary and I don't know how to work a, a logic analyzer to find out, I have no idea what's being sent over it. So maybe that monitor is just a DVI monitor with a funky plug, but then it could be VGA because sometimes when I turn it on, when the computer isn't on, it'll say analog input, no signal detected. So is this just pushing VGA? There's arguments for it because it's going through, you know, what, 10 feet of cable in the car, maybe a couple more because it's got to like curl around things. That's not a whole lot, but it's going past, you know, RF cables for radios that could be leaky and all sorts of other, you know, control and, and signal cables. So maybe they found that DVI wasn't perfectly reliable. Uh, but VGA will work in any environment. You can use it in a in a nuclear reactor or next to an x-ray machine and you'll just get speckles on the screen, right? So it's possible that they're sending analog signals over that cable. I just can't figure out for sure from, from this part number whether that's true or not. But one thing that makes it more likely in my head at least is uh, the fact that there's an SDVO chip at all. I mean, why would they need one? Shouldn't the onboard chipset have its own DVI output? Well, it might not have a VGA output, and this might have been the easiest way to get a VGA DAC. And it does say TV VGA DVI on it, so it's capable of it. If I had an oscilloscope here, I could just probe these out because it's pretty easy to recognize an analog video signal. Uh, but my good ones at the office and my cheap, crappy, tiny LCD one is nowhere to be found. So someone else will have to do this important work. Sorry. So anyway, we're going to want to take this board out, but we run into a problem it's attached over here by the one other interesting thing about it. This is a coax connector and quite a sturdy one, but that is the signal from the composite input on the back. It's the video signal going to the uh, Connexant capture chip. And that's kind of weird because that means that's an analog, like composite video signal that's being sent from here all the way across this board to that chip. So it's passing by these ethernet chips at a minimum and, and whatever other signals are on here. There, there's a thing where they can do uh, flat coax in PCBs. So maybe they did that or maybe it's just not a problem. I don't know. But yeah, I thought that was, that was really unusual. I've never seen that before. So that exposes part of the uh, motherboard, but we're gonna wanna get this thing out as well. And this thing is also interesting. So it comes out easily enough, except for all the, the cables wrapped around it and uh, these guys down here, which are, are clipped on there. So I'll have to pop those off. But before I set it aside, uh, two interesting things. One, I believe this is the CMOS battery and I cannot get this uh, foot off without destroying it. But you can see it's a strange one. I suspect it's rechargeable. Not sure, but at any rate, it's much, much bigger than your typical CR2032. Also, 
I'm a big fan of this board over here. No idea what that's for. It just seems to have a couple transistors and some resistors and capacitors on it. But its sole purpose is to plug in to these two cables. So for some reason, this cable from the lower board comes up here, plugs in there, and then goes back down to something underneath the board. Why is this up here? Why couldn't they put it down there? Was it an afterthought? Probably. So there's the SIM card reader. And then of course we've got a thermal pad. What else? This is aluminum. So, you know, it's part of the thermal solution as always. And that appears to have been sitting on top of this coil that was probably used in a VRM. Also, we've got this thing here and this is fascinating. I'm not sure exactly what it's for. It's spring loaded though. It's got a really, really heavy spring in there and it seats into this little metal dish that's like soldered to the, the motherboard. All I can think is that that's more vibration reduction. Like this thing sitting up there uh, would be isolated from the board below it a little bit, I guess, but it's got a rigid connection here and that means it's gonna be pivoting around that. So yeah, huh. Am I missing something? I mean, what else could it be for? Now I'm not gonna go through and inventory all the chips that are on here or anything. It's a pretty normal PC to put it simply, uh, but we do have a CF card holder, naturally. Any sort of industrial embedded PC is gonna have one of those somewhere. I'm kind of surprised they weren't using it though. I mean, at this point in time, 09, 2010, you could get pretty sizable CF cards that could tolerate a decent number of, of writes and there were embedded versions of Windows that did okay on those, but again, for some reason, it seems like they didn't want to shell out for, for Windows 7 embedded for this thing, so they ended up having to use a, a spinning disk. You know, probably when this thing first came out, there was an XP embedded version that did use the CF card, so that's probably why that's there. The other interesting thing here is the Wi-Fi card. Uh, this is just a, a ABG, which I can never remember, but I think that was outdated for 2010, but you know, again, what do you need? High bandwidth in your your, your cop computer? Why? Uh, but what's more interesting about that is this strap here. Like I said, everything in this has to be bolted down securely so it can't vibrate loose. And the antenna cables are no exception. They are clamped real good under there. If we spin those out, we find that underneath this, there's some more foam rubber. So they're cushioned as well. Pretty nice. And honestly, not a bad idea. Like, I've never heard of an antenna cable falling off uh, from being jostled around in like a laptop bag, but it can happen. And you know, now that I think about it, that's probably part of the reason that the antenna is on the bottom of that GPS module, right? Because if it were on the top, then they would have to come up with some way to hold it down. But if it's on the bottom, then the act of securing the module itself also secures the antenna. All right, I believe we can lift the motherboard out now. Oh, right, before we can pull the motherboard, we have to take out the uh, sort of, um, IO shield in the back here. There's another big hunk of cast aluminum for you there. All right, now this will lift out. And of course we've got to unplug all the many, many cables. What are we hung up on? There we go. All right, there's the computer proper and now it just kind of looks like a computer, right? <laughs> We've actually got a socketed CPU. I kind of didn't expect that. I was expecting a BGA. I don't know if they made BGA Core 2s. Maybe they hadn't started doing that yet, but there you go. Uh, that's gonna be your chipset. Um, this is, what is this? You know what? That says secret on it. I just realized this. Oh my gosh. Hello, Soba. Honey. Honey, I'm trying to work. Please stay away from the static sensitive devices. You are made of static. Soba, you're inconvenient. I'm trying to make a video. Don't, don't chew on that. Don't, don't, I need that. All right, honey, time to go. Say goodbye. Okay, sorry for the interruption, you know, surprise inspection, what can you do? So I looked up this chip, 
It's an Intel 82801GB, and that's basically a Southbridge. It's an I.O. controller, and that's all I know about it. Unsurprisingly, there's no Google results for Intel 82801G secret. Uh, my guess is that it's just a version of the processor that's, you know, passed some sort of certification for use by governments, militaries, that sort of thing. I mean, hell, I don't know. Maybe it's got tempest resistance or something. Whatever. Uh, we're never going to find out the answer there. And when it comes down to it, there really is nothing special about the hardware in this machine. And I'm I'm sure that's that's really not uh, any different. This thing is basically just, you know, like a Lenovo T420 laptop, just in a, a very, very heavy chassis. So there's not a whole lot to say about it beyond uh, what you've seen, except I do want to comment that the, the thermal solution isn't exactly what I would expect. I mean, this thing is definitely built to last, right? It's, it's built to tolerate some pretty unfortunate environments, obviously. I mean, everything is screwed down, including the RAM, all right? I've never seen this. There's little clips on the sodiums, so they can't pop out. So they wanted it to survive harsh conditions, but that's why it seems so strange to me that pretty much nothing in here gets the benefit of, um, of decent active cooling. Uh, this here is where the CPU touches down, that spot right there, and that backs up onto these two fans here. And that's it. That's like the only cooling in the whole thing. I mean, the chipset, the, the, the north bridge, that lands on this little uh, thermal pad here, so that's getting uh, cooled as well. Uh, but then everything else in here, all the other components, they're just sort of, um, well, they're just sort of baking in their own heat in the air volume inside this machine. Now, I realize the CPU is the largest source of heat in here, and probably the chipset right after, but that doesn't mean that these other components don't generate any heat, and I just don't know how any of it's getting out of here. There's, you know, there's no, there's no vents anywhere. Everything is, is hermetically sealed once this is put together, so all of the heat from, you know, the, the Wi-Fi module and the GPS and, and anything else that's in here... The only way it can escape is by slowly seeping into the chassis and then getting dissipated by this uh, passive sink over here. And that just doesn't seem adequate, but I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it made it this far, right? Perhaps these folks at Motorola know what they're doing. Yeah, who knows? I mean, to wit, they did actually do a much better job with the CPU than I initially gave them credit for. Because uh, if you look at it, you realize it's actually not very well mounted, right? There's no screw holes anywhere near it. If we uh, take a look at the board here, uh, we've got this one and that's it. So there really isn't anything to, to hold the CPU down against this surface. And that seems like it would get really uneven pressure. And I could not figure out why they would do this. Like it seems really half-ass and, and not at all adequate. And then I showed the pre-release version of this video to several people and, and a whole bunch of them came back and said, uh, hey man, didn't you notice? This thing here is meant to hold the CPU down. And duh, of course it is. Of course it is. Right, right. That seems obvious. Now, this little metal cup here is directly over the back of the CPU die. And this guy uh, sits right on top of it. And it is hinged, right? And it uh, it contacts the top of the chassis here. And then it's got the um, the spring there. And that applies force directly on the center of the CPU die and keeps it clamped down against the uh, the heat sink. That's honestly kind of brilliant. Um, I mean, it's kind of janky. You'd think, why not just put more screw holes on the thing so it can actually be screwed down correctly? But for whatever reason, they couldn't do that, I guess. And uh, this is a, a perfectly adequate solution. It explains why it's so heavily sprung. So if you've been wondering for the last like 20 minutes since I brought that up, what it's all about, or screaming at your screen, you know, come on, dumbass, don't, <laughs> can't you do simple geometry? No, the answer is no, I can't. I'm really bad at visualizing things in three dimensions. Uh, so thank you to all the people who pointed that out. So yeah, in the end, I, I just can't get past how inadequate the cooling seems to be. But I have to admit, um, yeah, the proof is in the pudding, right? It, it seems to have made it all these years. So who am I to criticize? But anyway, let's uh, finish this pickup and go back to the footage I shot two months ago to close out the video. That's all I've got to say about this thing. It doesn't have a whole lot else going on uh, that's worth mentioning. Just um, a few more furniture pads here and there. It's an odd split between, like I said, very bespoke custom parts and stuff that you just sort of 
put together at the last minute out of whatever they had laying around. But that's sort of typical for this kind of niche industry. On the one hand, there's definitely enough market to make many, many thousands of these things. On the other, there's not a big enough market for them to throw them all away and remake them if something goes wrong or if they decide to change the, the definition of the platform a little bit something like that. So that's what you're going to see even at the high end, as it were, you know, even from somebody like Motorola, at some point when you're only making 20,000 of something, that sounds like a big number, but it really isn't all that much. And even if it was 500,000, half a million sounds like an awful lot of something, but the economies of scale are just completely different compared to, you know, three or 10 million of something, especially when some of those parts could be interchangeable with other products that you're making. So with anything that's not going to be sold to the mass market, you're always going to find these weird little um, corner cuts made late in the process. And I think we've seen a couple of those here. In the end, I guess I'm glad that I never tried buying one of these things off eBay because as it turns out, yeah, they're they're kind of boring if you're not using them for their one single purpose that they were designed for. They don't really fit in anything else. There are much better uses of 30 or $40. You can buy a lot of machines that are a lot more generic than this and you'll get a lot more use out of and often are more interesting inside. Nonetheless, I'm still very grateful to the person who sent this to me. Like I said, I don't have any other rugged machines, um, so I was glad to be able to take a look at one. Uh, but in the future, I'm sure I'm going to get more, and uh, I think those will end up being a bit more interesting than this one. This one was pretty much just a computer. I hope you had a good time watching, though. If you did, then consider subscribing to my channel so you can see more episodes when they come out. I'll definitely be making a lot more of these. There are gobs of industrial and embedded PCs out there that nobody has ever looked at, so I'm excited to continue the series. Uh, but if you want to make sure that I can continue, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. Uh, this is my full-time job. Uh, these folks are paying for my groceries and gas in my car and, and rent and, and everything, and I'm incredibly grateful to them, uh, but also for having a budget. This thing got donated to me, and there's several others uh, that have been offered, um, but most of the time I just have to go to eBay and just buy stuff for 50 or 100 bucks and hope that it ends up being interesting, and uh, my patrons are the reason that I have a budget to do that. I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making that possible. It is absolutely amazing. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.